Hello, everyone. Hello. I am Dr. Renuka Thakur. And this session is about knowledge infrastructure for transformation, design, implementation, evaluation of platforms to develop transformative, innovative practices. And uh, so I am Dr. Renuka Thakur, founder of Global Sustainable Futures Network, Progress Through Partnership Network. And I'm working to achieve Global Sustainable Futures Agenda 2030 targets. Established in 2020, the Global Sustainable Futures Progress Through Partnership Network materialized out of the need to glo connect Global South and Global North and co-address sustainable future challenges through constructive partnerships. So first, before going further, I would like you to listen to my TED talk. And please allow me to uh, play this TED talk to introduce to you our vision, objectives, and priorities. I hope you can see my screen. Despite very significant development gains globally, which has raised many millions of people out of absolute problems, substantial and that inequality between the richest and poorest countries is widening. The world has become more complex and poorer countries have experienced significant economic and social development. However, the inequalities within countries have been growing now talk of a global north and global south referring respectively to richer and poorer com communities which are found and between countries. There are many causes of these inequalities including the availability of resources, different levels of health and education, the native country's economy, and its industrial sectors, international trading policies next to markets, how countries are governed and international relationships between countries, conflict within and between countries. And researchers are called upon to address the base to climate science in the global south. These culturally diverse nations are united by common threats to sustainable future. Challenges faced in creating collaborations, partnerships across national borders and academic disciplines. Global Sustainable Futures Progress in an inclusive, collaborative, innovative, and engaging black public area researchers and like targeted startups and entrepreneurs supported by experienced seniors and business leaders where everyone can share in their research innovation, visualization, and enthusiasm in parallel to success. Our objective is a strong research environment, building to a multidisciplinary and multi-sectoral team of endogenous professionals that would be capable of pursuing and utilizing participatory and integrative approaches in solving public and environmental problems. 
Therefore, our priorities are empowering and capacity building, working with researchers to empower community individuals, increase independence to those and stakeholders, the lack of sustainable practices, fair and inclusive to economic and social and environmental fair access to quality life and working conditions. Networking sustainable ship net effective net transforming traditional society systems to most and above all Create sustainable or sustainable community of critical mass of. 105 countries have joined me. So, create sustainable. Thank you. Thank you for listening to me. And I believe and encourage systems thinking, multiple stakeholders engagement, and active participation of effective governance and management of sustainable transformations. Transdisciplinarity methodologies, co-creating solutions that are multimodal and very stakeholders. And that's why I have developed a program that allows this network to successfully develop, uh, deliver full-fledged collaborative and interactive activities, co-creating knowledge and practices beyond national borders and academic disciplines, and contributing to SDG's Ad Agenda 2030. We have created this network where we have been able to facilitate collaboration, partnership across low, low, mid, low income, medium income, and high income countries. And we have reached out to many, many uh, practices which will encourage sustainable global futures contribute towards sustainable global futures. And we believe that these all practices are urgently needed and vital for our society. So I, as I already mentioned in my TED talk, network has planned uh, many engaging and interactive and inclusive and enthusiastic programs for networking and capacity development. From the first start of our uh, uh, pro, uh, network which was on 1st January 2021. And I'm pleased to again share that this TED Talk was made in October 2021. And since then we have grown. And just now today I have like 1,250 coordinators from 123 countries. The group is inclusive and accessible, accessible for all stakeholders, including academics, systems thinkers, innovative practitioners, change makers, creative voices, etc. So I emphasize that any discipline, any individual or institution or group, whoever are motivated to contribute towards sustainable transformation can join this group and can forge connections between them and make some difference to the society. 
I only want to briefly now explain you the design and the delivery of our network. So this design of my network is underpinning systems thinking, which is my core interest. Social technique, and I have uh, combined or integrated four systems, and I would like to just speak and introduce those systems to you. Social technical systems, which focuses on having interface of social demands and technological solutions developed to fulfill or provide solutions to those demands. The most interesting to me from this social technical system, which was coined by Gills in 2002, is multi level perspective. And mainly there are three levels. Bottommost is called micro micro level where the individuals do innovations and the middle level is meso level where market or demand is created for these innovations and then finally there is an uppermost level called macro level which has greater influence and intensity and when these all come into conjunction and engagement and innovations flourish and that is what we need at this point in the world where we are struggling with uncertainties and complexities. The another systems thinking is system uh, thinking uh, concept is coupled to human and natural system and discussed by many researchers, including Downing 2000, 2012. And there is a widespread recognition and discourses underpinning science and practice through coupled human and natural systems. These systems impact immensely on environment, so very much needed for environmental protection, conservation, and of course, climate change. However, they are not capable of delivering economic sustainability. And find, and the third one I am fascinated with the theories underpinning complex adaptive systems as revealed by Morem and Sani 2011. And especially in relation to wider complex glo uh, global processes. These systems put uh, emphasis on internal organizational change with the influence of external environment However, being economic and institutional entities and governed to deliver certain societal services and practices, again, these systems are very effective, but not fully in the position to deliver sustainable transformations. And therefore, I bring in the most significant and the one, the last one, final one, which I believe is broader conceptualization of sustainable development in response of driving pragmatic shifts of sorry para, paradigmatic shifts in framing and decision making of everyone individuals and collectives as beautifully studied and presented by wise et al 2014 Having provided my underpinning theoretical understanding, I have adopted, and I would like to share one slide here. And here I have this one uh, very complex figure. However, you can see here three layers or three multiple perspectives or levels, and which I call individual, organizational, and interorganizational. And here, this framework was uh, a product of my PhD, but also then followed. After the, my PhD, I studied it for 
sustainable transformations for the societal input, like for the uh, uh, societal benefits. And this framework, what it does me, uh, to me, that it allows me, uh, and, and, and I have applied practically for my designing my this network. And this framework allows me to drive the whole multi-level engagement process, which is delivered through my network activities and outcomes, which collectively contribute to the desirable multi-dimensional sustainability objectives that global future holds. It not only allows me to implement, but also to evaluate the performance and feedback to my relevant stakeholders or my designing or my programs, unpacking the knowledge of the complexities of the societal system and diminishing the uncertainties for future pathways. This framework also suggests that it should be reiterative process and help us improve our sustainability performance. So thank you for listening to me and having introduced my network and my design for the network. And now I would bring in Abd El Hamid Sarif, who is currently a Sustainable Development Green Technology University Fellow at the university, American University in Cairo, a member of YCA Network of Youth Climate Action. His current research focuses on the usage of marine algae in salination brine remediation and creating value via blue economy in developing countries. He's also a member of Space Generation Advisory Council and the Moon Village Association. I'm very pleased to have him here. And he, Abd Al Hamid Sharif from Egypt, will now discuss the opportunities to disseminating information and having those personal and professional opportunities in more intimate and close basis that would allow direct access to the doors at which the members could knock, which saves time and creates exposure. Exposure is very important. That is what Ab Al Hamid believes. And he says that people who are interested in gaining practical experience, they must be engaging with such networks and simply uh, having no zero experience or not screened out uh, can also be possibly um, making their way to the through these networks and can possibly um, gain uh, employment, uh, access to conferences, summer schools, and grant application. Mm -hmm. So welcome and please take the floor. I will stop sharing now. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Inaka. So I'm, I'm not sure if you could hear me properly. Can you hear me properly? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, so um, so basically I wanted to reflect on the virtual part because I'm still within a master's program at the American University in Cairo. And we have seen that with the um, the onset of COVID-19, um, everyone began to flock to virtual education, to things like Zoom. Uh, Zoom, for example, we had the stock market value of three, around 73 USD in January 2020. By October, it jumped to 559 USD within the same year. And, and um, it allowed people to receive education to connect to work virtually, but a big disconnect or a problem of inequity when it comes to COVID-19 implications on education. Uh, for there been a UN uh, report uh, uh, in 20 that says 24 million children worldwide wouldn't come back to school uh, and will basically drop out after COVID-19, even after this, the states reopen the schools because from poor backgrounds so when they uh, did hit the countries they went to informal sectors for work 
to some lines, some work and waste management, and it would be very hard for them to, to get income back and to lose the income after like two years so far. Uh, so in that sense, there's a big inequity when it comes to education and effect of COVID-19 on the global north and the global south. And also, one of the things we have seen when it comes to education in relation to COVID-19 is that in many cases, many organizations, because basically when you are organizing a virtual event or virtual conference, you don't have to book a uh, a room, you don't have to do catering, you don't have to fly in speakers. So organizations began to really treat virtual opportunities, which is great because it gives people access from different countries, uh, from different locations, different backgrounds. But the problem is virtual educational events would, would, would risk becoming a dime a dozen. So the, there will be some sort of a, a law of diminishing returns. So basically, the more events you attend, the less substance you could get from these platforms. And the, there is a possibility to rectify this by combining virtual opportunities with actual on-ground So for example, as someone from the global um, opportunities in the field of sustainability, environmental advocacy, environmental protections, are much less than in the north. Internships at UN programs, at World Bank, IFC, um, even like organizations like Greenpeace International, than in the global south. So in that sense, in that sense, we need to feel that by attending these events, attending these uh, uh, educational events you could get this exposure that would allow you to build connections and also get hands-on training opportunities. Um, I think one of the rules of networks like this, because you focused more uh, intimate relationships with the donators in a way that you could ask for a certain internship, ask for a certain training opportunity. And that's very important for global sales because Again, we have much less opportunities here. So we need to think about, again, the substance of the content provided on online and virtual platforms, and also what it leads to. It should be uh, not an end in itself, it should be a means to an end, a means to an end in the form of opportunities to actually apply what you're learning virtually, because at the end of the day, Education is something that you use to apply something. And I remember uh, being on a project on rooftop gardening where we actually went to a place where we got waste, discarded waste, and actually used it to build the planters for the community. And it was like a community with children and everyone working with their tools. And that was much more valuable than being there sitting on a Zoom uh, session for two hours and basically sleeping half of it. So there should be a balance between what is being done virtually and what's being done on the ground. Uh, yeah, and I don't want to take much more time, so I will leave the, the floor back to uh, my colleagues. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. And having having these, like uh, many of them are asking the, uh, you know, that uh, sound was not there or the video was unstable. I'm com I'm really sorry about this. It's just because of the network, low, uh, low network. But uh, the TED Talk is on YouTube. And if you can, if you want to just uh, Google or uh, saying uh, TED Talk by Dr. Enuka and you will get that TED Talk. So if you want to listen to that, Please listen, and I would like all of you to join my network because it is free and there is no commitment. Uh, this is a platform for everyone, and we, we welcome everyone here. So following uh, the this, I would like to invite, uh, like, welcome Alaya Rator from Pakistan. And... Alaya is environmentalist, environmental impact assessment expert, and content writer. She holds many awards in debates, essay, 
creative writing, including academic award for the year. She currently works for the Funds for European Union and the Asia Foundation. They sponsor her organization, Amna and Ali Ki Dunya, which means Amna and Ali's World in English. Her campaign has launched a series of books revolving around the two characters, Amna and Ali, aged 10 and 14, representing a middle-class Pakistani family and showing the aspects of Pakistani culture. Through these characters, key message relevant to the fight against COVID-19 is delivered along with other important messages to build awareness on social issues and develop good habits, including environmental protection, conservation, and climate change. She has built her expertise in environmental impact assessment with a formal training in environment management graduating from the National College of Business Administration and Economics and many certificates from internationally renowned institutions. So having talked about how important is networking, including creating an inclusive, collaborative, innovative and exchanging platform, uh, engaging platforms for everyone, mm -hmm. students, academics, researchers, businesses, entrepreneurs and like-minded stakeholders, and completely understanding the significance of how these virtual programs offer opportunities along with the balance of face-to-face uh, -face, which uh, our previous speaker explained uh, having a right balance i invite alaya to introduce us to her pioneering critically important and outstanding work she has been doing thank you so, so much Dr. Renika, for kind words. Uh, and yes, uh, as she has already told you guys that I'm a published children's book author, but I think the real question is that what brought me to this point where I think that we need to uh, educate the upcoming generations um, of Pakistan. That I want to be specific to one country. I think that when we all were kids, there weren't as much environmental climate change issues that we have our duty and responsibility to educate children from across the globe in every country in every city in every school to know and understand the climate change and environmental issues because eventually they will be the one who will have to put them and we will be pretty much old to you know do anything else so we have to make a platform for them right now so with that the i i think that um when i was a child actually the entire entire my thought came to the to the power with another really tiny story that i want to put here is that when I was a child, my, my teachers used to uh, gather us around and they used to tell the stories. And I, I used to sit and imagine everything she's saying while I'm imagining how whatever she's speaking. So that gave me uh, the job, the, the chance to uh, you know, come across this fact that uh, when they're young, they're very imaginative. They have a very superpower of imaginative things that will uh, in future, you know, come up to be one of the most innovative, important, uh, you know, factors to change. So, um, that in like two years ago, I, I came up with this idea that we should um, combine the very imaginative power of children with the climate change issues and write a book and both of worked. I designed a couple of books. So, my initially my uh, motivation and my my aim was uh, we need children that they will learn climate change issues when we have books and also imagination with their creativity over the time. They might come up with something, with some, some solution to the environmental issues that we're facing right now. So I, um, I designed a couple of books. Uh, the first one is uh, Fish Don't Wear Mask. This was uh, designed prior to COVID-19 and this book uh, talks about how we are impacting wildlife, how fishes are, you know, suffering from plastic pollution. And in, in after, in, by the end of every book, we have like these words for children. So they know what they're learning. They can actually put these to the actual experiences of their life. And that, I have another storybook. And what my aim is to educate children as much as I can. So what I do is I, for example, if I'm talking about deforestation or um, uh, atmosphere, 
I tend to put it in the in the in the bottom corner so they know what they're learning. Really, now what my entire aim was that the books should be written and published in uh, in letter easy for lower income students for lower income schools to understand. So I wrote these in Urdu. The books were later translated in many languages um, from English to Urdu to it was it was translated in language now we're working in, uh, in Singapore to translate these books in other languages so yeah the best part, part is I had no idea Dr. Renika was there to help me so implementation took place in uh, in five countries including Pakistan I I was able to reach children lower income countries in uh, I was able to uh, reach children in Kenya and Uganda in Nigeria, in Pakistan, in different cities of Pakistan, and I reached 15,000 children and I could educate them virtually about how they can make uh, make environmental issues go, how they can keep their countries clean, how they can, you know, work uh, to do something better in the future. So the my implementation part usually has uh, three key roles, A, to encourage them to draw paint so they can have have a strong memory and make sure that children are uh you know recycling something for us and uh, they're they're recycling so they know that recycling is a very important part so we uh in the we take uh take care of three things that the children learn the three r's which is reuse and recycle as much as they can so uh yeah this this is my aim that i want to reach every child in this in this earth in the globe and reach them and teach them about climate change and environmental issues. And I really encourage all of you to teach the children who are going to grow up and face all of this. So with that thing to say to you guys, that imagination has more power than we can imagine. Because when I imagination, I brought that to life, that I think that children should be able to imagine, maybe they'll bring, be able to create something uh, you know, plastic eating machine someday soon. So yeah, George Clay had a had an initiative, had a creative, um, you know, imagination. So he he uh, imagined that there would be a flying object. So that and and in 1903, by by Wirth brother, they were able to a flying object. Now that we use every day, which is a helicopter, a plane, and so yes, imagination can take you. There is no, there is no boundary for imaginations, and reality can be it. So both we can, you know, reach by educating and children to pop out the idea of actually doing something they want. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Anika. Thank you, thank you very much, and I'm, I'm so pleased that you raised this uh, point of imagination. If we don't imagine we are not going to create anything and i you will you will be surprised that my daughter calls me alice in wonderland <laughs> and and i i think yes we want to invite everyone to imagine their sustainable future and work for that exactly thank you thank you very much for this speech and uh, your showing your work i think it, it's it's beautiful it is wonderful so now I will bring in Kushal, Dr. Kushal Adhikari. Dr. Kushal Adhikari is faculty and research associate in the Department of Environmental Resources Engineering at Humboldt State University and serves as a guest editor and reviewer across different academic journals. With interest in sustainability engineering, Dr. Adhikari has made significant contributions in creating a sustainable and resilient future through, their, through his research and academic teaching. Now, having talked about uh, this, our networking and uh, what a virtual platform can do and what benefits they can bring and for all these, education serves as a, a, a foundation. And, and now we will dwell into more details of some research work and bring up a practical examples where 
something has changed for sustainability, like sus has taken a sustainable pathways. And so I, I would welcome uh, Dr. Adhikari to show uh, his research that, and, and he has given me a, a, a small snapshot of what he is going to tell, which I will relate narrate here, that research has shown that more than 50% of freshwater withdrawals end up as wastewater, which can be great resource to deal with the global water crisis. However, only less than 3% of wastewater is reclaimed for beneficial use. So Dr. Adhikari will share some findings from his research on what impedes the reuse of wastewater along with recommendations on how we could possibly increase this weight to fight against water scarcity. Besides, he strongly argues that networking plays a key role in disseminating innovations and discoveries across the globe, resulting in transformation and implementation of academic research findings, and will be sharing his experience of GSFN also. Thank you. I, I invite you to take the floor, uh, Kushal. Uh, thank, thank you, Dr. Radhika. So, as uh, Dr. Renuka brought about the topic of water sustainability, I'll be focusing on that issue today. So to start with the problem, we all know that we are in the verge of having a severe water scarcity in the coming decades, which is not very far from us. So we know the problem that we have the limited freshwater issues, the population is continually increasing, and consequently, there is increasing food demand, and also there are several changes in the climatic factors, which all is creating an stress on our limited fresh water, leading to the water crisis. And uh, on the other end, we also know the fact that wastewater, which represents around more than 50 percentage of freshwater withdrawals, can be a great alternative resource to supplement our freshwater resources. But the research shows that only less than three percentage of wastewater is currently being reclaimed for beneficial use and also it's from the research that if we are able to increase the re recycle rate to 15 percentage the fresh water could last up until 21 25 instead of what is projected as of now which is 2030 which is just a decade from now but there lies several problems why this reuse rate is only three percentage Regardless of, we know the fact that it could be a great resource to supplement our freshwater uses. So, on as I was working on this research, some of the things that I came to find was one is was the techno-economic challenges, which includes like the cost of the treatment, and also most of the facilities are centralized treatment systems and are located near the cities, and the there are very limited facilities outside the cities or uh, in the rural communities and also they lack the expertise or the staff to operate those facilities and the next problem that i observed was the environmental challenges which it mainly includes the energy consumption and the environmental footprint from the treatment facilities so and these are the two challenges that has been identified long ago and several efforts are being done through research in these areas and also several new discoveries and new technologies has already come up to deal with these two challenges. However, we are still in a dilemma or we are still not sure how to deal with the third challenge, which is the social challenge or how we can increase the public acceptance of using the wastewater for our daily uses, whether it be the agriculture or any other purpose that we could potentially use the wastewater. So based on research that I observed was like social challenge is the major issues for us to bring our academic innovations or the research findings into implementation. So this is the area where I'm currently focusing on how we can increase the public acceptance for using the wastewater. And for this, like what I strongly believe is the first thing we need to do is we need to focus more on the interdisciplinary research and not just the engineering research. We as an engineers being on this field, like I think just focusing on the technical aspect and the engineering aspect may not solve the community or the society well. So we now should be careful enough to incorporate the society and the public when we do any engineering research so that we can have the perspective perspectives, ideas from all the community, and we can come up with a better design, how we can address that 
can be adopted by the society and the community thereby making impacts on the society. So that's what I think one of the key things is the interdisciplinary research. And likewise, the next thing that I observe is like the networking and the public awareness again. So and through networking, like this is from my own instance, like I was working on uh, research and in developing a simple low cost wastewater treatment system, also known as Pond in Pond. And I agree that through the scientific publications or the academic publications, we can reach to the audience, but it will be a very limited audience and will be only in the disciplines that we are working. And it's very hard to reach the audience outside our limited area of the discipline. So through networking, I think it's a very good opportunity where we can disseminate our research to a larger audience and to a larger community so that we can have the policymakers there, we can have the society, we can have the people from the different sectors and we can express our findings or uh, share our research to a larger community so that we can have the input and it helps in the rapid implementation of the findings that we are able to make. And this is like from my own research that I have been working pond in pond and I got an email out of nowhere saying that like i don't know like since i gave a talk on gsfn which is the global sustainable futures network on a monthly talk and he was able to find that on the youtube and he saw my presentation on the pond in pond and they are doing a case study in one of the small communities in india so like it may not have been possible just from my research because as i said like that the research is only the papers are limited to the our discipline only and the people from the community may not reach out to but looking at that video the community it's a very my design is very simple and low cost and that can be adapted and the focus is that it can be adapted to small communities so building the small my goal is to build the small communities and then automatically the nation can grow and the world can su survive so through that video they are doing a case history and which is really proud moment for me and that's when i realized that networking has really a great power in disseminating the research and helps in the implementation of our findings. And therefore, like I really would like to thank the network that I'm in and several other networks, including this platform for providing us this opportunity to share and disseminate our research. And hopefully our research, all of our efforts will make into implementation and come into a policy level through the collective efforts of everyone, the society, the policymakers, the researchers, the scientists, the academicians, and, and the entire society. With this, I'd like to conclude and give the floor back to Dr. Renuka. We can't hear you. You are mm -hmm. muted, Dr. Renuka. Sorry, thank you. Thank you for telling me. Yes, thank you, Kushal. Thank you very much for uh, sharing this example. Uh, of course, your research is very invaluable, like it is immensely important for everyone because though we are going to have uh, sea rise and plenty of rainfall and so on, but we are going to always struggle for the fresh water. And that is, uh, you know, people are developing salination uh, plant and other things where which are not necessary and they are just... Uh, building on our uh, carbon emissions. Whereas you have a very, very nature-based uh, uh, solution and it is so effective. So thank you for sharing that. But also thank you for sharing this example, your the benefits you get from networking. So thank you very much. Now, our last but not least, uh, the most, most uh, innovative inventor, original thinker, uh, New York Times business bestseller author, Sharon Dreamonger, I invite you to uh, this stage. Sharon Dreamonger is designer of systemic brain change models. She has trained global corporations for 40 years on how to facilitate and motivate decision-making and congruent change. So I invite her and I, we have spoken about all this networking and all those examples, but what we 
mm-hmm. we need to change like we need to motivate people to change their decision making to make decisions that are effective for our change that what is needed in this future and we know the world is hurting that food insecurity and climate change makes it hard for people worldwide to live happy healthy and safe lives and yet even flocks committed to sustainability throw up our hands in frustration what can she do or what can i do what can everyone do to make a difference and that is the question which Sharon Drew would like to tell us, uh, like answer and tell us why we aren't getting people motivated with our initiatives and what we can do differently to inspire them to take actions. So welcome, welcome on this floor, Sharon Drew. Thank you. So early in my life, uh, just as a person, I tried to make personal changes and behaviors about myself I didn't like, and I realized that my my new behavior would last just a brief time and wouldn't be permanent. I realized that you can't change a behavior by trying to change a behavior. And I realized that change has to initiate in the brain. So I began studying uh, for 40 years and innovating on how to create new neural circuits for new outputs and new behaviors and new habits. Um, When I started doing this uh, 40, 50 years ago, actually there was nothing written on it. So I had to make a lot of stuff up. And thankfully my concepts have proven themselves to be accurate over time. When I got involved with the Global Sustainable Futures Network, um, I decided it was a good, good time to use my models to help motivate action. But I was embarrassed myself that, I mean, I recycle, I drive a Prius, I don't eat meat, and I think that's not enough. So I called my friends and all of us are very much engaged in the new new ideas coming out in sustainability and hunger and homelessness. and, And all of us just feel helpless, like the problem is much, much too big. And so I decided to use my models to inspire others to take action. We realize that the problem is just huge. I mean, we have to shift capitalism, greed, politics, motivate corporations, governments, NGOs. I mean, it's just an enormous problem. So what I came up with is an idea to engage people in just taking one step for one two hour commitment. And if everyone would do that, we could make a difference. Let me tell you on why we're not getting as much um, action as we should be getting. First of all, we're using information to tell people, to explain people why they need to act. I have a secret that no one's going to like. Sorry, sorry. Information does not teach anyone how to change. Information does not teach anyone to make a decision. Information will be sought by those people looking for that information at that time, and they have a place for that in their brain to understand it. And those of us that don't have that type of circuitry will not understand and will not be motivated by it. It's a brain thing. Let me explain very briefly how our brains translate new incoming data. And by the way, I'm running a four part series on this uh, starting March 2nd with Renuka and the Global Future Sustainable Future Network. And I'm gonna be, we're gonna be doing this together and I'll be teaching how and explaining, and so please join me. Anyway, the first thing is the brain thing. Brains don't translate according to words spoken. What happens is incoming sound vibrations, incoming ideas end up being signals in our brains, and then those signals get dispatched to circuits in our brain for translation. In other words, we can only translate and understand according to what we already have in our brain. If we don't have it, we will ignore it or we will mistranslate it or misinterpret it, not understand it for sure. So when we use information, we will only find those people who are already looking for that information and those people that may need motivation will not be influenced by it. So, and everything we hear, everything everybody hears is automatically biased by our 
our history and our subjective experience. So just remember, whatever information you're sharing is not going to cause action. Second of all, behaviors are only beliefs in action. And when we're asking people to change behaviors and ignoring the beliefs, you, but a behavior is an output. It's the end result of all the programming that's occurred. So you can't start at the end. You have to start at the beliefs in the beginning. And a lot of our messaging doesn't touch someone's beliefs and it would not inspire action. What I suggest is that we create a new stream of messaging in addition to our marketing and our content details and our URLs and so forth with our goal to motivate one step. A separate goal, not to educate, not to share, not to offer our brilliance, but only one step to one step and for two hours. Okay, that's a different goal. So I suggest that we use one sentence, two sentences at most, that involves a local problem using local languaging, local idioms. And if, for example, here in Kansas in the States, there were 30 tornadoes in one day. That's unimaginable. Whole cities were raised. Everything in them, thousands of homes were destroyed, people displaced, thousands and thousands. What if somebody said, to avoid another tornado, I'm going to take one step to make sure it doesn't happen. There's the campaign. One sentence. I'm going to help you all develop sentences or two sentences in, our, in the four-part four program I'm doing starting March. I also want people to get links to local actions, to local groups, food uh, Oregon, Oregon has the um, uh, the food sustainability. Put it in two-hour time segments, even if it's your company or your research lab. Put together some volunteer things they can do for two hours. That will be like one-on-one -on -one branding. You can they will meet you. They'll figure out what your product is. They'll learn about your product. They can go to the food bank. They can take steps that you put in a, a page of links that people can choose from. So they can volunteer even in your organization or with your group. One step, one sentence, lo local problem, local idiom to get instigate action. With a focus on this, we can get everyone to take one step, just one two-hour step, and hopefully, if we all do that, it's manageable, people won't feel helpless, and we can inspire action, and we can all make a difference together. Thank you. I can't hear you, Renuka. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sharon Drew. Excellent, excellent. So you have... Pro uh, provided us how to make a change, a tree, just a, a teaser. And we are looking forward to your forthcoming episode, uh, four episode series, and learn more about these on our platform. And yes, uh, we have seven, six minutes now. And if anyone in the audience have any questions, please write down in the chat. We will be happy to answer. I would just like to reiterate here that we welcome everyone to join our network and make this possible. Make our sustainable futures designed by us the way we want and implement our own practices they are which are sustainable not only for us but for the future generation so and any any last comments i would uh, appreciate if any speaker wants to make any last comment please uh, take the floor and uh, say some words if you want yes Ab abd el ahmed yes please yes uh I wanted to say something um, in relationship to Alea because um, I have seen in when we did the, the community program with children who brought his children who didn't speak Arabic and the kids in the community didn't speak in any
that the work with the waste and the printers, they were able to play together and they were like friends over the language barrier. So I understand the the merit of art um, and also to bridge language gap. That's, that was a real testament of the power of art, children playing together without learning the language of each other. I wanted to say something in relationship to there are many nature pollutions being investigated currently, like for example, and using algae or microorganisms or using things like uh, mangroves to hold on the rise of seawater would be something that could be disseminated to local communities. And that would be very important in citizen science. Basically, local communities a lot about sustainability and sustainable practices. Uh, so maybe that's an angle of education, getting citizenship as science, citizen science, to be incorporated in sustainability. Thank you. Thank you very much. I would like to make a few announcements of our uh, network that we do monthly Friday idea exchange programs, which are run on second and third Fridays, two to four time afternoon. So anyone who wants to join or want to present or engage with such dialogues are welcome to join. We also have these programs live on YouTube and uh, on PZAZ Paz TV channel. Uh, we have forthcoming uh, three very interesting programs. One which Sharon Drew is going to lead on it, and it is four episode series on uh, how to change the behavior, and she will be talking more on it. Uh, secondly, we are coming with a, a documentary on uh, educating uh, farmers in Indonesia on coffee and uh, vanilla plantation. We will go through the whole life cycle of these crops and educate them. And we will have a very, uh, say, very uh, effective campaign to change their practices and to show them how, how easily they can change without any external resources or finance. And the third one, we are coming with a very grand online concert. And that concert is like online and worldwide. And uh, it is um, uh, like uh, all the instruments that are played there are from recycling uh, 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 things, like they have been recycled or uplifted. Uh, they wear also the costumes which are recycled and they are also going to sing songs or, on uh, recycling and sustainable development goals. So we are going to come with these three fascinating uh, uh, you know, events. And our, our network is always open for everyone to come and join to have their innovative uh, ideas to uh, like imagination what they you have, maybe dreams come true. <laughs> and that is what any any last uh, comments, uh, Sharon Drew, would you like to say? Um, one of the problems we all have is that we assume that information will cause someone to take action. But we have seen that that's not true, whether you're selling or marketing or coaching or leading, telling somebody what the good idea is doesn't make a difference. So the question becomes, how can we engage in belief? How can we communicate in a way that avoids their bias and direct our communication to facilitate their brain to act without our biases getting in the way? And we have to stop assuming that good information will cause action because it won't. Um, so I'm happy to discuss this and we'll create new solutions starting March 2nd. Thank you. Thank you very much. And any any last comments from Kushal and Al Alaya?
I, I'm good on my end. Yes, Kushal? I, I, I'm good. Good, good. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have just last one minute and we don't have any questions, but I think uh, we are all done. And uh, thank you very much for all these speakers and the uh, organizers uh, to join me. I'm grateful, very much grateful to Catherine, Annie and everyone here on the platform who have uh, managed our uh, session very well. And uh, thank you very much today, all the speakers to join me from worldwide, like uh, irrespective of your timings, uh, difference here and in UK and your place. So thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.